Um, let me introduce at the far end, Tim Carstens, who is an algebraist or algebraic geometer, and or he used to be, now he just does the cybers. Um, <laughs> this is Parker Thompson right here, who I am told is a delightful chap. Um, <laughs> And now he's, he's a lead um, um, a researcher at CITL. And I want you to know that we have him to thank for this talk because it was his idea that they expanded on. And then there's this other guy. Um. <laughs> Mudge. Anyway, <laughs> please give our speakers a welcome hand and enjoy the talk. Thanks, guys. Good morning. Uh, hello, my name is Tim Karstens. Uh, I want to thank Mud, uh, I want to thank Mouse and Spawn Zero for that lovely introduction. Uh, so today, uh, I have the enviable position of setting up for you a beautiful story. A beautiful story. If you like a story that has graphs, I have good news for you. I have very good news for you. If you like a story, un petit vignette, kernel internals, Linux kernel internals. We have a little bit of that too, a little processor architecture. It's going to be very nice. Prefix menu, quite lovely. And if you like slides with an off black background, <laughs> come on, huh? Off black is the new black. So uh, we are uh, Cyber ITL, the Cyber Independent Testing Lab, CITL. Three names, you can pick whichever one you like depending on your level of comfort with words like cyber and, and labs and all that. Uh, we are a 501c3 uh, not-for-profit. We were founded in 2016 by Sarah Zacco, seated up front, and our good friend Mudge. Uh, our mission is a tiny, a tiny little part of the mission that everyone here is a part of on some level, right? Uh, the mission here is to you know, improve the security of things. Our particular method of doing that is to try to bring information about security to consumers, not in the form of general reporting, but in the form of specific reporting on popular products and systems, things that you can purchase, download, go out to the store and buy, those kinds of things. How secure are they? That's the kind of thing that we do. Uh, our MO, we're vendor neutral. We are not funded by the people we review. We are not funded by their adversaries, their competitors. We take money from other parties who are interested in the same mission, don't have another dog in the market, right? Uh, and we do this work in collaboration with our partners, uh, Consumer Reports, the digital standard, uh, with uh, R&D support uh, from DARPA and others. Today's talk in order to like get, you know, settle in, settle in for a story, right? You know, where are we starting off here? We're going to start with this here, the continuing security challenge. Another th thing you might call this is maybe the challenge of our current times, right? And it goes something like this. Some things, some things are quite secure. I'm not going to say perfectly secure. That would be a naive thing to say. But, but some things are quite secure. Maybe you can think of some things, right? There are some things that people work on, famous people work on, big famous teams, very accomplished teams, amazing defenses. There are things like that. There are some very secure things. It's not most things. It's not most things like by a wide measure, right? It's like not even close to most things. Like you think about most things. How much stuff is most things? You don't even, you don't even know. None of us even know. Most things is like a lot of stuff. Have you ever seen the internet? <laughs> Have you ever seen how many binaries on the internet. Yeah, sure, you know, right? There's a lot. Nobody here thinks that most of that stuff is secure. Nobody here is running around downloading every little thing they can and running it to see what happens, right? It's not what you do. If you do that, though, actually, I have some URLs you might like. <laughs> um, but, you know, so what we're going to be talking about today is just a tiny bit about why isn't that improving or, or how do we get that to improve? How do you increase the average? How do we go from a world where some things are quite secure and most things aren't, to a world where most stuff is pretty good. That would be like kind of the next logical step for us, right? Okay. I want to bring us back to, I'll call it the old school. This guy would call it the like, I can't, it wasn't that long ago school, you know? Right? I want to bring it back a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to bring it back a little bit here. No data, no action. No data, no action. Does anyone remember? Yes, the answer is yes. 
right? Not long ago, like, high schoolers were frequently writing exploits for, like, major systems, right? Like, you know, that was, like, kind of, like, not, you know, it's impressive, but it wasn't, like, uncommon, uncommon, right? You know, okay. That's what the world used to be like, like, legit, right? At that time, if you were dropping O'Day and, like, using your name, it's because you were really interested in being a lightning rod for, for lawsuits, right? Now we talk about it. There are vendors who will sue you still, but it's, it's kind of the exception. I mean, it's, it's not unheard of, but, you know, not everyone who writes a blog post is getting, you know, retaining counsel first, right? It used to be a lot, a lot more of a real thing, you know? You could really have some serious stuff coming after you for it, right? That was the old days. How did we get out of that? We got out of that because people persisted. They said, this is a serious problem. It's not just fun and, yes, it's fun popping shells, but it's not just fun and games. There's other stuff at stake too. And so they worked, released material, put the pressure on, show the public, and things have happened. Things have happened. And so that's the kind of mentality we want you to be thinking about here, that tradition. So. The last things I'll do now is do a, a little bit of a, a pre-telling of the story. What's this talk going to be about? We're going to talk about, uh, for lack of a catchier name, this, this broad-based empirical approach to looking at the state of security writ large or in a sector or whatever, but more than just one program at a time. We're going to be talking about these broad-based kinds of things. And big shocker, the outline here is pretty straightforward. How do you do these kinds of studies? What kind of studies are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about these kind of four-step things. Remember that vast sea, the internet? You go there and you collect a bunch of software. There's, 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 I know you spend like all your time trying to avoid downloading all of that software, but like there's like a lot of it. So you, you go out and you're like, okay, it's time to W get. Time to get banned, get blacklisted a little bit, lose my AWS. Let's do some of that a little bit here. You get a bunch of binaries and then you pick something you can measure. Now, hanging out, talking to your friends, there's a lot of stuff you could measure, but I mean, no, you pick something you can measure. I don't mean something that's going to take 100,000 lines of new tooling. You take something you can measure, and you measure it, all right? Is there a lot of stuff out there like this today? Not so much. What can you learn? We'll see. So we're going to be talking about that kind of thing. And with that, I'd like to hand off now to our lead engineer, Parker Thompson, who will tell you a little bit about firmware by the numbers. Hi. Welcome today. So I want to talk about one very specific case of a research project that we undertook to explore our own methodology and try and smoke test whether or not this is going to work for us and really dig our te uh, teeth in. And we picked IoT and embedded systems. <clears throat> Primarily because uh, there's a really large data set, Tim mentioned, going out there and fetching that. That's not always easy. Sometimes it's quite hard to fetch a large data set. But luckily in the IoT space, we have a history of publishing public firmwares and made it a little easier. So effectively, our method was to go out and crawl all the vendors that had publicly available um, download URLs, uh, like in like support sites, uh, select that down for some of the bigger players in the game, and then fetch all their binaries, pull in relevant metadata, uh, all their different updates that we could, and then do mass extraction. So we primarily do analysis on desktop software. So we were targeting Linux file systems effectively. And what, what did we find? Well, we had 18 vendors. We had initially 22,000 firmware images we downloaded, and we uh, filtered that down to about 6,000 after we did our extraction and filtering out things like real time uh, RTOSs and other stuff like that that we don't have the current capability to analyze. Then when you look at 6,000 firmwares, uh, that's 2.7 million binaries that we had to process. Uh, and fun, uh, really interestingly, and something I, th I personally think is very exciting is we were able to tag in release dates. So we have 15 years worth of data, uh, 15 years worth of firmware updates, uh, going from 2003 uh, up to 2018. And a lot of the firmwares are in the second half of that, but it's mostly due to the growth of the industry. I want to dive right into some of the data we have. This is CPU architectures in our data set over time. At the top of the line there, following that line along, that's MIPS. That's Linux MIPS. And you can see the next line down, the greenish line, 
is ARM. I had this discussion a few times already this weekend, and people said, oh, well, you're looking at MIPS, but MIPS is dying. <laughs> huh. Interesting. Um, so we can see well and above, MIPS is still the most common architecture out there in devices uh, that are in our homes, in our racks, uh, in our conference center Wi-Fi's. Um, and it's important to understand the context. Like when, we're, when we start talking about architectures, we need to really see what the market looks like. And it's nice to start off with this, seeing where, we've, where we are now. Let's dive into what we look at. <clears throat> so this is a chart, uh, this is a table of some sampling routers. Um, now, this data set we have is a lot of different products, not just routers. But routers are something that we all have some amount of famili familiarity with. This list is taken from a best of 2017, best of 2018 consumer reports uh, chart, a uh, uh, list of uh, routers. And each row is a router specific version matched roughly to the release date of that same report. And then on the right hand side, we have hardening features. These are things that are, can be commonly built into your Linux ELF files that will mitigate uh, against a specific attack or something or class of attack. And we have common stuff, ASLR, stack guards, rel row, fortify source, non-exec stack. Looking at it, we color coded it so it's a little bit easier to understand. But zero means uh, though each of those cells is a percentage of binaries in that firmware image that had that feature. I color coded them. Red is none. Yellow, uh, orange is some. And green is most because there weren't a lot of 100%. Um, and we can see, like, if we look at that Linksys EA in the middle uh, and the Netgear R7000, we have machines that are get, uh, devices that are getting at least a high percentage of non-exec stack, but other components are severely lacking. And these are modern images. And these are the best of lists. So it's an interesting introduction. I wasn't that surprised to see this, but it does uh, kind of elucidate what's going on. But let's dive a little bit deeper. Let's look at some trends. This is a change in hardening features uh, grouped by vendor. So this is vendors that released firmware in 2012 and 2018. And this is the change in those hardening features of their entire product releases in those years. So green means that more binaries were hardened. Red means less binaries was hardened. And yellow means no change. And we can see some positive trends here. We see that uh, stack guards has gone up a few percentage points. Uh, Fortify source is up mostly across the board. But most concerningly, we're losing ASLR. In that time frame, a 20-year-old technology, we're not able to hold the line in devices that are shipping. And it's across every vendor. So, I was concerned by that, but it definitely started to get me interested in exploring deeper into these trends and think how things were happening over time. But we also need to look at what's going on today. So again, we have all of the vendors released that released something in 2018. Again, cells represent uh, the percentage of binaries of the entire product lines that these companies ship. This is the percentage of binaries they ship with a given hardening feature. And like, let's look at QNAP in the dead center. They have uh, a very high rate of non-exec stack. And there's about 22 uh, firmware account accounts there. Some are more, some are less. But you know, this one vendor is seeming to get this one thing right. But when you look at this picture in aggregate, I see a lot of red. And I see a lot of very low percentiles. And it also is kind of interesting to uh, notice that these percentages are quite low, which means that the last slide was amplified. Because when you go from 0% to 1%, it's a little bit of an amplified effect, unfortunately, when you just look at a raw delta. Let's look at something else. Let's explore what happens when you update your product. In order to do that, I'm going to talk about the SIDL score. Now, the SIDL score can be thought of as a proxy for, of all of the different hardening features that are available to a developer, how many did they turn on out of that set? And then we normalize that score, add in other components like uh, complexity and a little bit of other things. But it's normalized on a range from 0 to 100, 0 being no hardening, 100 being as hardened as we analyze for. 
And on the right hand side here, we have a histogram of changes. So what we did is we took the first release of a product and the last and the most recent release of a product and we said, okay, what happened to the score for all the binary, the aggregate score for that firmware, what happened over that timeline? Um, and we can see by this histogram that most of them are centered dead around zero change. So that means no change in hardening whatsoever. But there is a bit of a tail off to left there into the negative. And a negative delta means that the score is going down, which means that as they're releasing, they're losing hardening features. And when we look at the raw numbers, it becomes even more clear. We had 300 different products that improved their level of hardening over their release cycle, but 370 that lost fe hardening features and got worse. So this means as you're updating your devices, it's more common that they're getting, uh, they're, it's more common for them to get less hardened over their product cycle life. Yeah. Um, we then took the same data set and look at the, looked at the standard deviations. Like, let's look at the things that changed the most. And unfortunately, the one that changed the most was this product. It was a downward change. So we here, ha we here have a, uh, a, a time series, effectively, of this D-Link product, this D-Link DAP 2690. And on the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have the score. And it starts off around 60 and moves along. And then somewhere between 2013 and 2016, we see a precipitous drop in that line. What happened? Why is this happening? What does this indicate about the build systems behind these products? And I wanted to point out, it started out at a 55 score and dropped down to about an 18. Neither of those scores is good in our system. That's still about like, you can conceptualize it as like half of the things they could have turned on they did. Let's dig in. What happened? So the same product, same x-axis of time, but this is a Gantt chart. Each point represents a release, and the line represents how long that re uh, release existed in the market. And then that top line, that teal line, that is ASL, ASLR coverage, the percent of binaries that could be ASLR'd, how many were. And they started off at a 30%. And then somewhere in that late 2016 release, all of them were, all of the binaries lost ASLR. They, they got some RELRO though, a few percentage of RELRO. That's that red line. This means fundamentally that these vendors don't have a system for testing, checking, and verifying that the hardening features that they believe to be turned on and sometimes were are still present. It's like ignoring all your unit tests. I also wanted to look at how products, uh, how the patterns of products for a whole vendor work. We didn't just look at small, uh, small devices. For example, that last device was an enterprise device. D-Link sold those by the pallet. They're end of life now, but they were a high-end uh, 802.11 access point. I also was curious about uh, vendors that have a more of a prosumer and enterprise tier, and so this is Ubiquity. This is product scores. Each line represents a product. And then it's a time series. So as, how does that score change? And while each line is interesting in its own regard, most of them are flat. What I find most curious about this graph is the shape. It diverges. You would expect a vendor, well, maybe not expect, but you'd consider it would be a reasonable expectation that a vendor would have a uniform build system because Ubiquity ships primarily onto very, very similar CPUs. So not a lot of uh, divergence there. But, Instead, we see as time goes on, the graph expands, we have a lot more divergence. And that means that there's no unified build system. Things are allowed to do whatever they want. Build teams might have different pro uh, processes. And finally, on the right-hand side, there's that purple line at the top, and then there's a little green line at the bottom. This means in the last year, Ubiquity released their most hardened product and their least. Let's talk about CPU architectures again. This is a double bar chart. And on x-axis, we have the uh, CPU class. So from left to right, ARM64, x86-64, ARM, x86, and MIPS. And then the, uh, the red bars are the average score, so the average hardening level. 
and the orange bars are the prevalence or count. So, two interesting things. ARM64 is a newer architecture, but it's, and it's the highest average scoring, but it represents a fraction of the market. On the inverse, the most common architecture being MIPS is also the least hardened. Let's talk about duplication. It's hard to get reproducible builds to work. It's really hard to make the same piece of source code build to the exact same SHA-256 hash. So let's go looking for duplicate binaries in our data set. We have about 2.7 million, I expect a few. And we deduplicate on the back end to reduce processing overhead. But when we start to look at it, what I did is I took about 4,000 4, of the binaries that were duplicated across at least two vendors. That's 4,000 binaries, and I made a heat map. Each access is the vendors. So where they meet represents the, pers the rate or the count of duplication. If the cell is more white, that means a higher level of duplication. See that, that, uh, that uh, more hot spot there? That's uh, D-Link and TrendNet. They, do ha they had over 700 binaries that duplicated across each other. So there's some type of relationship here. This uh, also represents, some of these binaries were duplicated about eight, across eight different vendors and 140 some different products. This is actually a very common thing to see. And this is my absolute favorite chart uh, that I've made because there are so many interesting patterns and trends. Like for example, why does Ubiquity, it's, it's a little hard to see on this, but on the very far right, why does Ubiquity and Netgear collide? But Ubiquity doesn't collide with anyone else. What do they share in common? What type of build, build chains and what type of like tool chains are coming from upstream? What is causing these vendors to have these type of environments? I'm not gonna dig into all of them, but I wanna dig into one specific interesting one. It was uh, the most commonly uh, duplicated binary. I used my favorite reverse engineering technique of running strings on the binary. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, let's hear for strings. Um, and found that in the GNU ELF uh, notes segment, there was a uh, mention of buildroot.org. If you're not familiar with what buildroot.org is, uh, uh, it is a open source Linux toolchain uh, and use, uh, user space generator. So it'll basically generate your entire file system, your user space, and build your kernel if you want. But it brings its own binaries. And these are very unhardened binaries. These are MIPS binaries, ARM binaries, but there's no hardening built into them. And so the vendors are taking this off the shelf uh, and then maybe, like, on the other hand, besides Builder, you might have something like Broadcom providing a tool chain. So this is, the vendors have these common sources that they're getting these binaries from, and they're building their user spaces out with them. And importantly, this means that there's a single point of failure. But there's also a single point to fix this. This means that we could potentially or build root could potentially patch in binaries that have hardening protections in them and affect eight different vendors, 100 different products, and raise the entire bar of the embedded Linux space substantially, and hopefully even transparently to the vendors who are shipping these products. So it's a double-sided coin. <clears throat> I now want to talk about what I think was one of the more curious relationships we found. This is a chart of different products, uh, different uh, firmwares, and their CPU architecture and their rate of non-exec stack. Looking down the side, we can see that MIPS is in orange and ARM is in green, and then Again, red, 0%, green, 100% on the far right column. Pretty quickly, you notice there's a bit of a correlation between orange and red. MIPS, almost every single MIPS firmware we looked at had an executable stack in every single binary. And this began to raise questions. Why? Why not ARM? What is, the, what is going on with MIPS? In order to understand that, we need to learn a little bit about the history of the MIPS FPU or floating point unit. Uh, uh, yeah, floating point unit. 
in the, in the past, MIPS did not have a very well-defined or sometimes kind of a bit of a diaspora of different instructions by different vendors of CPU chips. And in Linux attempted to smooth over that behavior and that functionality by providing a emulation layer so that if you had an unimplemented instruction, uh, the kernel will kind of smooth that over for you if it can emulate that. And it did this. Uh, it initially tried to look at, okay, how are we going to emulate it? How are we going to build this emulator? Well, you can't build an emulating kernel space because emulators tend to uh, in, uh, introduce a lot of uh, instability. Bad instructions, bad jitting, bad alignment, what have you. Um, this is even compounded by the problems with MIPS where if you have like a branch delay slot, if you raise an exception in a branch delay slot, this, the architecture specifically says that is an undefined behavior, so good luck. Um, building an emulator in this space, in the kernel space, was not going to work. One bad instruction, you would take your internal, entire kernel with you. So, at the time, non-executable stacks were rare. Stack trampolines were common. So where did they look? They looked to the stack to write their emulated frames, and this effectively allowed them to smooth over that behavior. Unfortunately, GCC and Clang and glibc all have adopted this as a standard for MIPS and output either missing GNU stack segments or executable GNU stack segments for the ELF files. This is how the FPU emulator or v virtual FPU, VFPU works. You have on the left the kernel space, on the right user space process with its, uh, with its code segment and its stack segment. You're executing along and you hit an add instruction. This vendor for some reason didn't have an add instruction. So you trap with a SIG uh, FP and you go to the kernel. That's then routed to MIPS DSMUL and it writes, an, uh, writes out a few synthetic instructions that attempt to emulate the add onto the stack into an MU frame. Then when it returns from its interrupt, it returns directly onto the stack and starts telling the user space process, hey, your instruction pointer is on your stack now. Go with it. That will run and do the add, or the simulated add, and then break or interrupt back to the kernel. That's routed to DSMUL. And then finally we return again back into the original process uh, at the next instruction, and the user space process is none the wiser. This unfortunately has the side effect of requiring every single user space stack to be executable for the entire history of Linux MIPS. I mentioned that GCC emits the GNU stack segment, and when we looked at this, we were really confused. Why? What is the behavior? I actually didn't realize you could omit the GNU stack segment uh, from the ELF file and have it actually load and uh, run. But let's take a little dive into the kernel to see how that works. This is in the loader, so it's very early on in the exec v uh, syscall. And we can see that executable stack variable being assigned to as default. Then we fall into a switch case, a switch statement, and we look at the different segments in the ELF file, and we inspect if we hit the stack segment, we check its permissions and assign that executable stack uh, accordingly. But remember, we have no segment. This switch case will never be hit. Then we go into the read implies exec functionality, and if that returns true, we set a personality flag on the process in the kernel. Read implies exec, and that pretty much does what it says on the box. Let's check that function to see why it's returning true. In here, we have a MIP-specific version of it because this function is overwritten by every architecture. And remember, that exec, uh, exec stack variable is still the default case. And then we first check it is not disabled, and we pass through and return true. We never check the default case. Now, I mentioned this is MIP specific. This is the exact same behavior, or roughly the same behavior of not checking that default flag for every single architecture except ARM64, I believe. Now, let's look at where the stack is mapped. Right up at the top, VM flags. Those are the flags going to be sent to the MMAP call to map your user land stack. We assign it to a default pound define. And again, we check that executable stack variable. And again, it's still default, so it's not either enabled or disabled. And finally, we walk up that pound define to VM stack flags, VM stack default flags, mixed in with a few other constants, 
and VM data, uh, data flags, and we can see the personality being read. And the stack checks that read implies exec flag, and if that's true, mark it executable, readable, and writable. And this is what it looks like. This is, this is bin cat. This is how every single red highlightation is a read, write, execute page. And that includes the stack, as we just talked about, but that read implies exec flag, that also affects every single anonymous mapping. And you know what's an anonymous mapping? The heap is an anonymous mapping. So we have a very, very, very prevalent area for our, uh, our different ex uh, exploits to go. And then, most importantly, is this isn't new. I'm not telling you something that isn't known in the community to the Linux uh, MIPS developers. They're very well familiar with it. So is GCC, so is glibc. This is common knowledge. What might not be as common knowledge, but it is public now, is that in 2016, this was attempted to be addressed. Um, LKM and MIPS Technologies uh, worked on a patch to bring no exec stack back to MIPS, or well, to MIPS for the first time. And they did this. They still had to emulate those branch delay slots. They still had to handle those bad instructions, uh, the, the missing instructions. So what they did is they moved execution off of the stack and onto its own little anonymous mapping that effectively operated as a JIT slab page. And this is injected into every single user space process. Where there might have been a problem was that when they, uh, they used a pound defined called Stacktop. Stacktop on MIPS is not the address on top of the stack. It's actually a hard-coded address. So it only is affected by whether or not you're running in 32 or 64-bit and your page size. But other than that, that little mapping at the very bottom that's a little hard to see, that address is static. And it's read, write, execute. And it's in every single user space process from Linux 4.8 and above. And unfortunately, uh, GCC and Clang don't have a way for to check for this, so they're still emitting, even after 4.8, they're still emitting uh, non -ex the ex executable stacks and executable heap binaries. Let's look at a little timeline. At the inception of Linux MIPS, this was introduced. And there was a generic uh, debt bypass, so executable stack, and most of the time heap, from 2.4, roughly 2001, all the way up to 2016. And in 2016, 4.8 was released. And now we have a generic DEP and ASLR bypass in every single Linux user space process on Linux MIPS. I don't know about the other operating systems yet. This is effectively an iceberg. The newest kernel version we saw in our data set was 4.4. So this is a bug that will be joining us soon as new products are introduced into the market. And we have this to look forward to. The LKM is familiar with this bug now, as is a number of different vendors, so hopefully we'll see a patch soon. Let's talk about what I just talked about. <laughs> Linux MIPS has been missing fundamental hardening features for its entire lifetime. And in 4.8 from 2016 and above, it got worse. There exists no safe version of the Linux MIPS kernel. There are things you can do, but it's difficult. There's a little bit of kernel hacking there. MIPS is both the most common architecture in the embedded space and the least hardened. Vendors, tool chains, everything upstream of the customer is failing to do even the basic hardening, let alone stack and uh, uh, ASLR and depth. Products get worse over their life cycles when viewed through the lens of binary hardening. IoT, up until this point, as we all know, has been a soft target. But by looking and going and getting this data, we've been able to find some very interesting things. But I think most importantly is we found that there's upstream, upstream common points that we can use to make very accessible changes to potentially move this needle. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mudge. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Parker. Um, I, when Parker first kind of came up to us with some of the tip of the iceberg work uh, they were finding, uh, we, were, we were blown away. 
Um, you know, nobody's really done that sort of depth across it. We've all heard that it's a tire fire. And it turns out, yes, it is, but nobody's quantified it. And nobody actually pointed out, like, there are some that are starting to do things correctly. Um, and if you don't know that there are some, you know, you can't make an informed decision and go, you know, uh, and act upon that. And there's no chance that the industry is really going to improve. Um, each one of the charts there, you know, prior to the, like, the Linux MIPS deep dive, really has enough data in it to stand alone and pull it apart and pull the threads on it and do an entire talk on those. You know, I, we're still finding new things in there. The Linux MIPS part was an example of just kind of extracting just one of those. But, um, you know, look at the build root uh, sort of uh, experience. Uh, as an offensive researcher, you know, you can say, actually, if I identify, you know, the right binary and work on an exploit in that, I have now affected between eight and a dozen different vendors across a hundred product lines. That's a nice multiplier um, for your time and effort. And similarly, you know, if you actually can influence a place like that, and there are other organizations, not just BuildRoot, we're not trying to pick on them, we just kind of identified them uh, in this, where, you know, fixing something, you know, will trickle out, you know, en masse and be a multiplier for the defensive effort. And this is all about how do you play the asymmetric game to your advantage? Because we're not going to play whack-a-mole against that amount of legacy stuff out there with that amount of problems. Um, so I encourage folks, when they post this online, we'll post the slides up uh, on our site, to actually spend some time and go through some of those because, you know, that's why we're sharing it, for you to, you know, kind of find your own nuggets. This is why Parker is so enamored with the heat chart, because he just keeps finding new things in there all the time. So now, with all that data, what are some of the things that you might take away from it that are actionable? Because we really don't want this to be security nihilism. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you go look at the report that we did, um, you know, we actually kind of give you some things that are you know, actionable that you can do that make a difference in the short term. And what you find of interest really kind of depends on the lens that you're looking through. So there are three that come to mind for me. You'll probably think of others. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, kind of description of those. Obviously, if you're a consumer, it's one thing. If you're security people or a vendor or developer, it's other things. The asterisk next to security people and vendors is because that's really not Settle's job. That's not our target. You know, it would be great if you can go fix things and we want to share the information for that reason. But consumers are who, are who we're trying to inform and give transparency to. We're very much modeled off of uh, consumer reports. Now, when I say consumers, that's a, a bit of a kind of loaded term because a lot of people think of the home user you know, as the consumer, like kind of the consumer reports uh, uh, exemplar for it. But we have a much broader definition of that, and that includes small businesses, large businesses, government agencies, um, you know, anybody who is acquiring or making a decision on something ends up being a consumer. So let's say you're that home user and you're choosing like home routers, what, you know, what can you do? We well, can actually go look at the report we did uh, and hopefully that gives you other information that wasn't available in consumer reports, PC mag and stuff. And if it matters to you that an exploit against the one you choose should be a little more difficult, move that cost to the adversary, you know, or a little more expensive on the underground market, you know, you could choose the, the Linksys WRT32X, uh, and that's kind of like the blue one in this spider graph or radar chart. And the way those work is the more coverage in like the kind of 360, you know, the better. You know, granted, it's still missing a lot of stuff, but it's got some things that actually make exploits a bit harder. You know, compared to the red Netgear in there, which is very minuscule, it's a Netgear R7000. I should point out the particular models matter a lot, as you saw with the Ubiquity chart, um, because of the spread that these vendors have. Um, or, you know, the green Asus, RT, AC, 86U, mumble, mumble, letters, numbers sort of thing. Um, but what if you're in a situation where you have, like, acquisition authority or purchase authority, and you work at, you know, an organization or an agency or a business? you're actually in an interesting, empowered position to kind of influence the market. Uh, you can go to those vendors when you're making your decision and ask for the post-build artifacts. You know, if they don't have it, you can bring somebody in to get it, or you can say, well, I'm going to go with somebody who has them, because if you don't have it, there's no way you're enforcing decent things in your build process to have this. Uh, and the more pressure that we can put on the vendors, you know, the more they might realize that this is 
a differentiator, and very importantly, it's a differentiator that's easy for them to actually do on this right now, and they will stand out when they do it. Um, but if it's, you know, something that CITL or Consumer Reports or other, you know, kind of non-biased and, you know, like kind of transparency organizations, you know, haven't given the reports on, you know, and you're in that position, you know, consider going out and, you know, funding some of those places to create the information so everybody else can make uh, in, informed decisions. So security people, you know, with, which we all are, that's kind of why we're here at ShmooCon, um, again, not our target audience, but, you know, it's who we are also. And the reason that we share this at these sorts of conferences is, um, you know, they're new findings to us, and, and we think they're important and impactful, and we want people to be inspired to go out and do similar sorts of research, uh, because there is a dearth of quantified data in our community, and, and it's really appalling. Um, you know, a lot is based on opinions uh, and what feels secure, but very few people are backing that up, you know, with actual data. So the more people can go out here, we're showing this is green fields, especially with breadth-wise sort of views to look for trends. And, wow, you want to maximize your offensive research, you find those large trends and you exploit those rather than chasing each individual, you know, version of a piece of software that's coming out. You know, similarly for the longitudinal studies that we saw. Um, you know, going through and that, you know, software from these vendors, the firmware images, you know, are getting, you know, at large worse over time rather than better. Very counterintuitive, um, but it's there to be discovered. Now, let's assume you're a vendor or developer, and by the way, if you're a developer that actually cares about security and are, are pushing for that in your organization, thank you. We, we need a lot more of you folks out there. Um, you know, one of the things Consumer uh, or CITL does not do is people say like, oh, are you going to work with these vendors that, you know, have those problems to fix it? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Consumer reports, you know, when they, you know, rate a bunch of cars and let's say, you know, normally Mercedes is really good, but there's one model that does really poorly, it's not consumer reports' job to go over there and work with Mercedes to fix it. That's not their target. They want the consumers to know that so they can make an informed decision. We get a lot of folks coming and saying, oh, well, you know, well, give us more work or give us more research, help us fix that problem. No. You know, don't, don't waste your time. Uh, if you find yourself in one of those reports, hopefully the report actually is uh, com comprehensive enough and easy enough and accessible enough that you can actually use that to change this. I mean, most of the stuff you saw here is from flags that we've known about for 15, 20 years in the compiler tool chains. And, you know, if you weren't using a compiler tool chain that was 10 years old, it would probably be on by default. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, if you're a developer or a vendor, you know, and you're, you know, distributing a Linux MIPS uh, uh, sort of product, you're a bit more up against, you know, back up against the wall sort of setup. But there is one organization, one group I think that we're aware of, that's actually gone in and disabled the virtual floating point uh, unit emulation in the kernel and rebuilt user space. You know, that's awesome. And I don't expect all the other vendors to, like, you know, do it. They're a bit more of a just kind of like turn the crank sort of shop. But why aren't vendors like that advertising it? Because they stand out like a sore thumb as doing something, and that's actually, you know, some level of effort. But if somebody just went in, like we see with, uh, and you'll see in the charts if you download um, uh, the ones off the website comparisons, we use a hardened version of Linux. Or if you look at Windows 10, the build process is very impressive with all of these things turned on throughout the lifecycle across all of the binaries. You know, this is very accomplishable and doable, and as soon as some of these vendors do it, and if it becomes a differentiating factor, everybody else should probably follow suit lest they're left behind and can't make the, uh, uh, the same sort of sales. Um, so yeah, maybe disable VFPU and rebuild kernel space, and, but, but advertise that, that, that you've done that. Uh, the build root one is a great example, and there are other organizations there. If you're a developer there, you know, a small change really ripples out throughout the industry. Now, I've been kind of, you know, encouraging folks to go look for the data, look for this, you know, we're sharing this to kind of inspire you to do similar research. And one of the pushbacks I get is like, and especially some people have seen behind the, the curtains at, at CITL, and they're like, you've got a lot of bespoke tools. Um, you know, you have hundreds of thousands of lines of, you know, code just on static analysis that's doing everything from, you know, call flow graphs, function hygiene, measures of complexities. We're pulling out specter and, and meltdown gadget counts, you know, to, to look at, you know, potential risks. Part of what we're trying to do is literally quantify 
all of the different you know, defensive tactics and see what sort of difference they really make against actual attackers, which also is why we've written our own fuzzer, um, which, uh, and why would you do that? There are plenty of good ones out there, AFL, et cetera, um, because we're trying to go breadthwise and we're trying to do it largely lights out so we can get these huge trends and say like, well, if, if I could only choose ASLR or DEP, which one actually makes more of a difference for this? Or what are the worst functions out there or the ones that pop the most in common libraries? Does it matter if, um, you know, uh, if, if I've got you know, way more ROP gadgets uh, and I have ASLR DEP you know, in, or way fewer ROP gadgets? Does it make it more challenging and more costly to an adversary to exploit? But in, and of course, then there's this large pipeline that you know, Parker put together to call all of this information and get it and put it together. So you might throw your hands up and say, I don't have the resources. I don't have the Parker Thompsons, the Tim Carsons, the Pat Stacks, the Sarah Zatkos in there. And um, just think back through all those slides. You can get all of the data from that with Reed Elf and NM. A little bit of like WGET glue sort of setup. You know, those ship with every Linux distribution, or at least they're in GNU tools for it. Um, so a lot can be gleaned from these measurements with relatively unsophisticated tools and relatively little effort. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And I really encourage you to kind of go out and get that low-hanging fruit right now, share more of these sort of trends, but backed by data. And this is, this is my call to action for our security community, is that think about all the things you've heard in our community from once you started. I don't care if you're new to the community or have been here for a long time. And in particular, one is coming from an expert or an authority source. And then ask yourself, have I ever actually seen real data to back that up? And it's really disturbing that the vast majority of the time the answer is no. And what we're finding is that when you do look for the actual data underneath, um, you know, the advice, the group think is wrong. It's oftentimes either introducing more complexity and more risk, and we're finding that those crash a little bit more often than the other ones. Um, but you know, nonetheless, we're told to layer uh, levels of predictable complexity on top of predictable complexity because that will make us more safe. <laughs> no, that's going to exponentially expand our attack surface. And it's probably not even going to work right under its own weight. Um, the other thing is that uh, to treat the field as a real discipline. Now, we gave you a look through of data pulled from IoT. You know, IoT is not our focus. It's just a subset. All software is ours. And we're finding very similar things like this in all of the other software as well. There are only a couple of products. You know, I'll use two as an example. Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge you know, start to do really bespoke stuff. And we get to use a lot of the neat whiz-bang tools to show the nuances between, well, why did Microsoft focus more on function hygiene and uh, less on sandboxing compared to Google and stuff? That's great. We're giving you, the, you know, a Consumer Reports thing on you're buying a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. Be happy with either of those. The rest of the world is littered with Fiats and Yugos and, you know, just lemons, you know, galore sort of setup. But you know, it's easy for folks to move those lemons up to something by doing some basics. You know, and we're eternally optimistic that it will get up there and we'll be able to share a lot more of the whiz-bang work. But um, treat the field as a discipline, not by opinions. Bring data to the discussions whenever you can. We're seeing that because of the dearth of that sort of uh, essentially ground truth and longitudinal and breadthwise uh, work in this field, it's a great opportunity. You know, we can actually, when we bring data rather than, you know, our feels secure sort of stuff to the conversation, you know, we can blow up a lot of the holy wars. We can undo a fair amount of the groupthink. And, you know, we can identify where we're kind of, you know, crosswise on what we think is secure what, versus what actually makes us more secure. So my challenge is just go out there and get the data and share it. You can do it. It's accessible. Thanks. Thank you. Um, more data is definitely better. I, uh, I, I've looked at some embedded devices and 
often I'll find that uh, certain binaries, like binaries that are running services that are network accessible, that are running as root, will be compiled differently and include more stack protections, not necessarily like uh, all, but I'm just wondering how precise of a metric do you think that that really is? Um, and, and just like how do you think about that in terms of, you know, that representing the overall security of a, of a device? Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, great question. Uh, I'll take a little bit and then maybe uh, Parker. Um, you know, we've definitely noticed that some people realize that certain applications or binaries, you know, are a bit more risky. Maybe they're, you know, listening on a port connected, you know, for incoming connections and stuff. But if you look back at the charts, um, those were for all of the binaries and you saw the number of zeros. So that's an exception, not the norm that people actually spend that extra time to do that. You know, if it was the norm, I think that would actually start to get us into some of the more nuanced discussions that we're, you know, chomping at the bit to share, but it's kind of like, why would we share that now when people aren't doing the basics of, well, what things that you do to protect those more sensitive applications make more sense and who's doing a slightly better job than the others. But until all of those zeros, which means on all those products with thousands of binaries in there, many of which, you know, a subset, are listening, they're not doing it. So. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll add one more thing to that as well. Uh, so absolutely in a threat model, the exposed applications are the principal objects of study, right? That's period, no disagreement. I will add one extra thought though as it pertains to looking at, for example, the entirety of uh, the firmware. Um, there probably is a more relaxed standard than what I would propose that would work for the internet as far as safety, right? If, 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 if a policymaker were to ask me for policy proposals, I would probably propose something that was more aggressive than the minimum that would in principle work. I'm okay in, in, in the abstract, I'm okay with an engineer making a deliberate calculated decision to leave things out. I would be surprised, however, if any of the vendors were paying anyone to be that picky. Yeah, because turning it on for that one is a flag that you could just do in the entire build process, at least in what we were showing there for the basics. But yeah, good point. 